Christ. We've been saying this is going to happen. We've been predicting it like Jeremiah. This strategy by the AEA has a sell-by date, and it came and went this session. Talk to us about Alabama's legislative session. What uh, it ended on Thursday, right? Thursday was uh, sign die. Is that how you pronounce it? Sign die. Uh, sign yeah, die. Yeah, yeah. So it is over. Thank God. Uh, yeah. That is probably the biggest takeaway is that it is always helpful when the Alabama legislature ends its session and can do no more damage. Uh, much of the last couple of weeks of the session was focused around gambling. Uh, folks may remember there was a big gambling package proposed early in the session. Uh, it would have included sports gambling, the lottery, and casino gambling at various locations across the state. Um, there was some controversy uh, immediately. You know, there were uh, very powerful groups involved with uh, lobbying both for and against this. Uh, you had the Porch Creek Indians, Alpha Insurance, others, uh, you know, putting their two cents into the debate. And so when it was all said and done, gambling didn't happen. Uh, there was standoffs between the House and the Senate in the final week. Uh, even in the final day, there were some standoffs uh, and some Hail Mary attempts to try to get gambling through, but it did not pass. So, you know, that was one of the things that dominated the session, particularly the second half of the session. Uh, after a lot of red meat bills early on. And so that's interesting to see, you know, here it is yet another year where gambling will not be voted on by the people of Alabama. Uh, whether you support gambling or not, whether you support the right to gamble or not, um, it's something that I think a lot of people are frustrated that they've heard these talks for so long. I mean, as you know, since I've been a teenager and was eligible to vote. I've heard debates in Alabama politics about gambling. Uh, there was a lot of people hoping to secure gambling for additional revenue uh, for various programs. <clears throat> there was a lot of uh, hot debate uh, that final day. So the education trust fund budget actually did not pass until the final day. Uh, it pa passed late that afternoon. Um, there was some talks that maybe the House was going to hold up the ETF to try to force a special session for gambling, uh, but they ended up backing down. Uh, there was a lot of noise about a COLA, a cost of living increase for uh, retired teachers, retired educators. Uh, you know, I give credit to the education retirees who did, uh, you know, speak up quite loudly, but they did not get anything. Uh, so that's interesting. That's another thing to follow. Um, you know, we've monitored the Alabama Education Association and their approach throughout the legislative session. So I know they went pretty hard on, uh, you know, retiree COLA. Uh, they were pinning their hopes to gambling and, you know, they got neither. Uh, so that's another takeaway from the session. The Education Trust Fund does have a 2% a whopping two percent increase for all employees. So uh, yeah, I think it's it's worth understanding, like sitting with that for a second, because folks will remember that in the big school choice fight, school choice, quote unquote, school privatization, the AEA was officially neutral. That is how they recorded themselves, officially neutral on a plan that will take a hundred million dollars away from school public school budgets and funnel it into private school budgets, the majority of which will benefit children that were the the parents of children who were already sending their children to private school and who are uh, the vast majority of them wealthy. Right. That's who this is going to be benefiting long term. Certainly. Yeah. I mean, I know there's yeah. some language in there about the initial rollout and, you know, it's going to be phased in on income levels and all that stuff. But, you know, but, we know the truth about these programs nationwide. Right. And, and so this, you know, they officially and, and, and the the implication and I, and I think it was made explicit in, in certain contexts and in certain rooms. I don't know how public the explicit saying of this was. But but basically, the theory is, the theory was, if we give them this 
as the AEA, if we don't fight him on this, we'll be able to get something for it. We'll be able to get something for our members for it, whether that's a raise or cola for retirees. They got nothing. I mean, a 2% raise is a pay cut, is a pay cut. They got absolutely, in, unless I'm wrong, Adam, they got zero for their complicity in the destruction of public schools in Alabama. Is that right? They got absolutely nothing. Well, I, I'm going to be looking over the next couple of weeks to see, you know, all the education bills that came through. Is there something there that they got uh, that we can't see? But if it if we're just looking at the big picture of, you know, did you trade away your opposition to school choice in exchange for the pay raises? Mm. I mean, if that's all you got, you didn't get anything for the retirees, which you made a big priority of. Right. You, you bust down the retirees uh, while we were down there, you know, lobbying for uh, against SB 231. So, yeah, I can't see it yet. We'll see. I mean, maybe there's something that I've missed. Uh, I'm I'm going to be interested to see their post session mm -hmm. wrap up and kind of what they are talking about. But well, and um, that's a good segue actually to SB 231 because there are some folks who wanted to take a similar tact to SB 231, which is you know the public opposition. Uh, you know, do we do we want to be too mean about it? You know, maybe let's work some back channel relationships, whatever. Uh, let, let's use the process to kill it and maybe we'll fight harder next year or whatever. It's just a very similar mentality. You know, like don't make too much noise. Don't make people too upset or whatever. Um, and and in both of these fights, both of them, you know, I mean, I, you know, look, I, which is not to say necessarily at least that every person who wanted to take this tact is malicious in, in their doing that. I think that there are a lot of people who genuinely think that that is the best way to advocate for their members and the best way to get things for their members. But just on a factual basis, not not, you know, uh, uh, stir in the pot on SB 231, the bill to remove incentives from employers who um, who uh, voluntarily, uh, recognize, voluntarily their recognize their unions. That passed. That passed. And and largely, you know, there was a little bit of pushback uh, from some sectors of the labor movement, but it was not it was not huge and it was not, uh, you know, u uniform in the opposition to it. Uh, and it passed and it passed despite the fact that the person who put it forward is, I am told repeatedly, a, uh, a pariah in the state Senate, Arthur Orr. Apparently I'm told over and over again that people don't like him. And I was actually told that somebody high up said that, oh, because Arthur Orr voted against the gambling bill, there's no way that his bills are going to pass this session. Well, they did. Mm. They did. And I, and I was told that it, 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 in order to say, like, you know, don't worry about it. It's, it's not going to pass this year uh, because it's Arthur Orr's bill and everybody hates Arthur Orr and he voted against gambling. So, you know, they're going to kill it to spite Arthur Orr. That's what, you know, that's what some people were saying. And, and so they were saying, you know, don't worry about it too much. And obviously that didn't happen. That didn't happen, right? right. And so, you know, the this is just, uh, it passed. It passed the House and it passed the Senate. And now it's at the governor's desk. Um, and this is, a, it's a bad bill. It's a bad bill. And so, you know, it really should call into question this strategy of playing nice with these people um, and, you know, not hurting their feelings and, and stuff like that, you know, like, is that a strategy that's going to work going forward? And it's, and it's, you know, to be fair to the advocates of that strategy, it's not as if that strategy has not worked in the past. AEA has been able to do that. They've been able to fill enough coffers of Republicans in, during campaign season to get the, uh, to the, to get the Republicans on their side in a lot of these big education fights. Right. Uh, but folks like myself and Adam have been saying for years, there is a sell-by date on that strategy. You will not forever be able to control Republicans uh, by playing nice with them. You have to, at some point, exert power, and the AEA has never made any indication that they are going to be doing that. And we've been saying, this is going to happen. We've been predicting it like Jeremiah. We've been, we've been saying, I mean, for years. And it's not just us, obviously, but for years we have been saying... This strategy by the AEA and, you know, folks like them in the state house 
has a sell-by date and that sell-by date has come and gone and it came and went this session in 2024. So between now and 2025 legislative session, the leaders in the AEA and the folks who are advocating these types of play nice strategies, we need to come up with something different. Right, right. And, you know, I agree with you that relying on palace intrigue is no substitute for mass organizing. I mean, bottom right. line. Uh, and we have to educate folks. We have to educate and instigate and agitate and get them engaged and get them involved and have mass opposition. Uh, people power is the only way we win down here, right? Because we talked this morning already about the extreme wealth, the powerful elites who dominate this state. Uh, they have media, they have lobbyists, they have law writers, right? These bills are written by their team. Uh, they have ex extensive networks on their side. So people power is the only way we can fight back. Uh, and, you know, it, it's unfortunate that uh, we suffered some really tough losses this session. You know, 231 is a big one, uh, but there were others, you know, the school choice, uh, that is huge. Uh, early in the session, we took a lot of hits. Uh, the restrictions on absentee voting rights, SB1, uh, it's a terrible bill. Uh, there were others. Uh, let me just tell you a couple of good things that happened uh, since there was some good news. We mentioned it in last week in Southern Labor, but there was finally some Open Records Act reform, something I've been pushing for for a really long time, ever since I first engaged with the Open Records Act and had to do some public records requests and realized what a joke our current law is. Uh, so there will finally be a little bit more uh, teeth to that law, which is good. Uh, summer EBT was included in the final general fund budget, along with uh, funding for Double Up Bucks, which is a program uh, to help folks get fresh food, fresh fruit and vegetables. Uh, but there was a lot of consternation around the summer EBT program. Uh, it was way more controversial, controversial than it should have been to feed hungry children during the summer months when school was out of session. Uh, so it was really... Uh, that was a good win, and, and I credit a lot of advocates who got involved with that. I mean, there were thousands of people who contacted their legislators around that issue, so uh, good work there. And another win, SB 119 by Senator Stewart, uh, that increases penalty for child labor violations. Uh, really glad to see that. Uh, you know, neither of us are big fans of, you know, criminalizing behavior, but when it comes to bosses, it's a little different story. Um, and that's good also because child labor laws were loosened up. 14 and 15 year olds will now have an easier time getting in the workforce because school permits have been uh, removed. Was uh, there ever an amendment to say um, <laughs> that parents have to consent to employment? I have to go back and see the final text of what passed. There was a House version and a Senate version. And I don't remember either version ever having – I remember there was something – there was a reporting requirement put in one version of the bill that said you have to um, – you, you know, if you employ a 14-year-old, you have to send a letter to the person's home address or something, right, which which obviously there are no loopholes there. You know, obviously that's going to get to the parents, no doubt about that. But um, uh, I never saw an amendment that would require parental permission. I never saw that. Yeah, so we'll look and see what, what amendments made it into the final text. Um, yeah, there's some other uh, stuff going on with the legislature. There, Alabama Rise is going to hold a legislative wrap-up webinar on the 28th uh, that evening at 6 o'clock. So uh, go to alarise.org, uh, check that out. That'll be a good way to get a wrap-up of the legislative session. We'll be continuing to cover it here on the Valley Labor Report. Hey, five seconds. Just wanted to say that this is only possible because of our donors. If you want to see more of this, then consider donating yourself at tvlr.fm slash donate. Um, we do have a caller on the line. We'll go ahead and bring them on the uh, um, on the uh, on, on the, the air, air from a yeah <laughs> on the air from two five six area code. Uh, I think I know who this is. Two five six area code. Uh, what's your name? Where are you calling from? Hey, this is Joe, man. This is Joe over in Decatur, man. I just wanted to mention a couple of things about the legislative session mm. and uh, 
Adam, of course, said just what I would, that uh, thank goodness it's over. Hmm. Uh, on the 231 bill, that Arthur, Arthur Orr uh, proposed and got passed. Uh, something, something people ought to think about. Now, now that we're going to live with that for at least another year, and it'll probably never get changed. Uh, why not give an incentive to uh, to unions when they do win a secret ballot uh, election uh, to give them some incentives, such as maybe uh, the state can afford to build Mercedes a plant and Hyundai and everybody else. Build them a union hall somewhere when they win. Uh, <laughs> pay their pay their uh, negotiating committee while they're negotiating contracts, because that's really who's improving uh, mm -hmm. workers' lives in Alabama. Uh, uh, one more thing, I let you go. They got their school choice bill passed. Of course, we knew that was probably coming, mm -hmm. but it's kind of kind of funny that. Uh, you know, that was all about choice. You know, got to have a choice. Well, they don't give they don't give the general public the choice mm. of voting on a gambling bill. They don't do that. Uh, they don't give the, the, the public the choice of uh, <clears throat> automatic recognition and organizing. I mean, they don't give them that choice just kind of funny that they'll give you a choice on one thing, so they say, but then limit your choices on everything else. One more thing, and this is just uh, really quick. I did see a bill that somebody had proposed. Don't know the number of the bill and don't remember who proposed it, but it was a bill to uh, to have a tax-free weekend a couple of times a year in Alabama. So uh, basically sporting goods, outdoor goods, wouldn't be taxed if you purchased them on that weekend. Mm. Now that's kind of crazy to me right there. But their, but their reasoning for it was we want to get some people outside doing some outside activities mm. like kayak and fishing and so forth. So on. Well, more power to you if you want to do that. I'm glad for you. But I tell you what, why don't they... Uh, when they got people that that they have to encourage to go outside, why don't they flip it around and uh, and give uh, the homeless a weekend in a motel with a hot shower, you know, a couple of times a year? Because them's uh, them's the exact opposite. Them folks mm -hmm. would like to get inside for a little while. But I'll leave it at that, y'all. Good show today, and I appreciate it. Hey, appreciate it. Thanks, John. Appreciate your brother. Yeah. Uh always interesting tax credits and tax holidays. And, right. um, you know, we were following one bill that Arthur Orr was pushing, mm -hmm. and it was a decent one, actually, the one that would have removed sales tax on menstrual products and baby products. And that one did not pass, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, I, I wasn't aware of the sporting goods one. That's pretty funny. Um, there was also a bill that we need to d dive deeper into regarding uh alpha insurance i was it mm. was told to me as the uh alpha disneyland bill so mm. that one sounds real interesting uh we'll definitely need to take a look at that um yeah there was there was so much that happened this legislative session um and then there was so much that didn't happen right, right. uh I was hoping for some criminal justice reform and there was very little movement there uh to address the massively broken criminal justice system that we have in this state. I mean, we've got mm -hmm. one of the highest incarceration rates on planet Earth. We've got this massive uh, system of, let's just call it convict lease labor, mm -hmm. uh, if allegedly convict lease labor. I guess I could clarify, but you know, it's the subject of litigation. Uh, the Department of Justice has determined that our prison systems are unconstitutional. Like right now, as I'm talking, right. they're violating the Constitution <laughs> of everyone inside. Um, not really anything notable on this. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and so a lot of and, and I, I, I think Joe's point was right on that, you know, they're very selective in choice. Right. 
they love to use rhetoric around choice for certain things, uh, but they're not consistent with that across the board. Not that we should expect any of these politicians to be consistent with much of anything uh, except for opposing us. But uh, yeah, that's a really good point. You know, you're going to have choice to use public school dollars to fund a private school education, but workers will not have one of the only two choices they have to get a union. You got mm-hmm. two options and we just took one of them away. What kind of choice is that? Uh, and yeah, you know, gambling, you know, I don't care a whole lot one way or the other about gambling personally. Uh, it's not something I'm really all that interested in, but, um, uh, I respect that people ought to have the right to make that decision. Um, it shouldn't be that hard to allow folks to vote on it. To right. me, it shouldn't be that hard. Let folks choose I mean, hell, have a ballot that says, do you want sports gambling? Yes or no. Mm-hmm. Do you want casinos? Yes or no. Do you want right. lottery? Yes or no. And we just roll with the results, right? And I mean, I'm torn on it because I see where gambling is not good, frankly, mm-hmm. for society. And and I'm concerned about the way gambling is now so mainstream in sports. I mean, you watch sports right. nowadays and that's all it's about right. is gambling. And that's a, that's a kind of shocking from where we were just a few years ago, where like yeah, you could really not have. talk about mm-hmm. it on ESPN and you know the Sunday night football game. It was not something to really be mentioned, but now it's so integrated into it. And so, you know, I'm not a cultural conservative, but I see that gambling has its detrimental impact on society and. It, uh, not necessarily the greatest way to fund government. But right. that said, Alabama raises the lowest amount of revenue in in the country or at least Mm -hmm. the second lowest depending on which state uh which year you look at we need revenue to fund like bare minimum basic services i mean that's why you know we spend so much of our legislative session year in year out fighting for what is already the status quo in like half the damn country you know we're fighting for things like summer ebt and medicaid expansion and things that are well established in other states uh Things, programs that are already benefiting our fellow Americans in other states and, you know, in large part uh, programs that we pay taxes into, right? Mm-hmm. Federal programs. Uh, so, yeah, I had a, a lot of frustrations with this legislative session. Um, and one thing that came really close that I was glad to see at least made progress was the paid parental leave for state and education employees. It did not get through this year, uh, mm. but it made a lot more progress than I've ever seen it make. In fact, it has hardly been in the conversation for years. Um, it's something that I've been really passionate about, especially since the birth of my daughter eight years ago and seeing firsthand you know, how the lack of parental leave for teachers impacted our family uh, and how many years it took for my wife to rebuild her sick leave time and all that. Uh, it's it's an issue that I think can be won on, uh, and I, you know, hopefully the education folks will kind of regroup after some tough losses this year. Right. You know, they didn't get much; of, they they got essentially a pay cut because their raise is less than inflation. They didn't get anything for retirees. Yes, the budget is a record budget. It's bigger. It's got some important investments in there. That's all true and fair. Uh, but they lost big on school choice and they lost big on DEI and divisive concepts. That's another one we didn't mention this morning, but, you know, let's not forget that that was passed. Mm. Uh, and, you know, there are universities in the state right now going through audits of their departments mm-hmm. to figure out what will be compliant and uncompliant with this new law. Right. And if, who, if people are going to have to lose their jobs over this. Right. You're talking about banning DEI and you've got entire departments named DEI. Uh, And so, you know, we've got people who may lose their jobs over that. And the divisive concepts part of the law is, you know, essentially trying to criminalize teaching the truth. Mm. Um, You know, for all the rhetoric around it, that's bottom line. They want to make it harder to teach factual information that they don't like that's it and you know 
teaching American history without getting into divisive concepts. I just don't know how you do that. Right. How do you talk about the journey of the United States of America without getting into divisive concepts, without talking about race, without talking about gender, without talking about class? I don't see how you do it. Right. And I think this is um, meant to scare teachers. Uh, I think it's meant to instill fear. It's meant to instill self-censorship. Um, you know, it's not so much that I envision, uh, you know, people reading through everyone's lesson plans with a fine tooth comb. I think it's more to scare the folks into censoring themselves. And then now, you know, they will have leverage if they find some teacher that's out there, God forbid, teaching, you know, the truth about American history uh, and race relations and things of that nature. Well, now they're going to punish them and go after them. And, um, you know, so that's that's really, really concerning. That's a that's a major loss on the education front. Uh, so, you know, I'd like to see the education groups really rally try to see what they can do to undo some of this damage from this legislative session, uh, but then also push forward, push forward on getting paid family and medical leave, family and parental leave. That's a huge, huge benefit that all state employees and educators need. It's all, all workers need paid parental leave. Uh, but in particular, you're talking about a profession that's majority female uh, and a profession that directly deals with the academic and intellectual development of children. So if anyone should know how beneficial it is for children to stay home with their, their parents uh, right after birth, it's educators. Um, so, you know, those are a few. Yeah, Joe prompted me to have a few more takeaways on the legislative session. Um, yeah, there's there's I think we may do some more reflections, you know, as we go throughout the summer and kind of dig into some of these bills. I want to go back to the child labor bill to see, mm -hmm. you know, how exactly was that final version written? Um, there's going to be some fallout with SB1, the absentee voting rights bill, because that's also going to be litigated for sure. Uh, and I, I believe SB231, the anti-union bill, will be litigated as well. Uh, so those will be, you know, to be determined how they will impact us. Um, but all in all, it just speaks to it speaks to the need for a mass movement of working class people in the state of Alabama, because that is something that we're missing. Uh, we have had progress in this state from time to time. It hasn't been long lasting or always by any means because for the vast majority of the history of our state we've been dominated by wealthy powerful interests today it's people like the business council of alabama uh but you know 200 years ago it was the slave owners uh we've long been dominated by a clique of wealthy powerful interest and where we've made progress is when we've had diverse people power rise up against that when white and black unite uh when men and women unite uh, when Christians and non-Christians come together, uh, because in Alabama and in, in the South in particular, like that has been the long lasting model is to keep the working people divided and conquered, uh, you know, along racial lines and nationality and immigration lines and gender and religion and all of these things. Uh, and what scares them the most is when ordinary everyday working people unite across this diversity and come together and see our common interests because we all want better lives we all want you know to be treated with respect we all want to be able to take care of our families and retire with dignity and go home safely and uh you know leave our kids in a better position than we started those are all things that we all feel uh and it's increasingly difficult in alabama to achieve those things and the only way we're going to make progress is going to be that mass movement of working people uh, to put so much pressure on these politicians uh, that we start to win, you know, and we won some things this year. And I don't want to detract from that every year, as bad as things are in the legislature, good people are able to get some good stuff done and good people are able to keep some bad stuff from happening. Mm -hmm. And that only happens with a lot of people's hard work, but it's going to take a whole lot more of it. 
obviously. We look at the results of this year, and it's going to take a whole lot more uh, to start really winning for working people and to start defeating some of this terrible legislation uh, that is meant to entrench corporate power at our expense or that is meant to divide us uh, and to, you know, attack marginalized communities. Um, so those are some of my takeaways. I think we can do much, much better. We deserve much, much better. I think most of the legislators should be ashamed of themselves and what they have done and what they have to report back to their constituents. Um, I was disappointed in how my legislators were completely unresponsive. Uh, and that is something I heard from a lot of people. Uh, I talked to a lot of folks about contacting their legislators, and a whole lot of them had the same experience I had, which is no response. Won't answer your phone call, won't return your voicemail, mm -hmm. won't answer your email. You know, you send them six, seven, eight emails, you still don't get an answer. You talk to their secretary, still don't get an answer. You visit their office, you still don't get an answer. So it's going to take a lot of work starting now. From now until the beginning of the next legislative session, we've got to get in their face. And these representatives and senators, we have to talk to as many of them as possible. and We have to put more pressure on them. They have to feel some pressure from working people in the community. Uh, because right now they don't. They think they can get away with it. They think they can do whatever they want to unions, whatever they want to minorities, whatever they want to the poor and to the working class, and they think they can get away with it. So it's going to be up to us to change that equation. You just saw a clip from the Valley Labor Report. We are live every Saturday morning from 9.30 a.m. till 12.30 p.m. And we pride ourselves on keeping all of our content free to everybody so that we can talk to as many working folks as possible. If you support the work that we're doing, you think that it's important, you think that it's good, then consider making a monthly contribution to the project, and you can do that on our website, tvlr.fm.